Welcome to the McKnight Center, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Darren Williams, and I'm the Education and Community Engagement Manager, and I'm joined here by the members of Canadian Brass, who have graciously taken time out of their busy schedule just to chat with me today a little bit more about their lineup and what we're going to be hearing today as well here at the McKnight Center. So thank you for joining us. Well, for those who maybe are a little bit more unfamiliar with Canadian Brass, could you tell us a, a little brief history of how you came to be and how you've survived five decades so far? It was 50 years ago when I was born. And that's how it came nice. to be? The nice. magic of Jeff Nelson. Right, I'm the, <laughs> the anniversary baby of the group. We're in our 50th year, so we started 50 years ago. This well, 1970, we were uh, five musicians standing in the unemployment line. <laughs> yes, and uh, we met each other and shared our backgrounds and realized that we could put a group together. And uh, so a thumbnail, just a real quick history. So that was 1970, and then uh, here we are, 2021. <laughs> okay, short, sweet, to the point, I love it, awesome. Well, given your vast catalog, and just with how many choices you have that you have perfected or you're working to perfect, can you take us a little bit through your process of how you choose to um, curate a performance? Cool. Well, the, the great thing about five different musicians is we all bring our own interests and our own passions to the group. So, for example, um, Achilles has a love of Latin music. And so we just finished recording a music video that's coming out really soon of a, a Venezuelan joropo. Is that how you say it? Perfect. Okay. With maracas and, and cuatro. And we made a music video and it's... Uh, we, uh, he, Achilles has a friend who actually did the arrangement. Uh, is he Venezuelan? Is he Venezuelan? He's Venezuelan. Great. And um, I like I have a love of Baroque music and early music, and Brandon has a love of basically anything from Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so one of the pieces we're playing on the program is is a, a new, brand new arrangement that Brandon did, and I think we're doing a couple new compositions as well, right, Brandon? Yes. Mm -hmm. They they might not even be on the program. Oh. They're that new. Yeah. Oh. But yeah. it may be newer information than what I've received from Stephanie. So yeah, I don't know. that's sort of how we test things out because, uh, well, especially now it's been so long since we've been playing regular concerts. Um, we have a we have some things that we really like to anchor our program in, uh, classics like Bach's Toccata and Fugue, but we also want to sort of uh, cycle through new repertoire too, and so we gradually try out new pieces as a year goes along. This last year was rather unusual, but we're going to be trying out some new uh, arrangements on the program as well tomorrow. Uh, there will be uh, Rimsky-Korsakov, Scheherazade is probably the latest new arrangement. Oh, okay. Well, with the sample of what we could hear, I definitely saw a broad span of time all the way from Bach, as you described with Scotta and Fugue, and then even some arrangements of the Beatles. So yes. given we could hear those in one performance, how do you navigate your audience through such a wide range of styles, genres, and even eras? Well, Brandon recently suggested that I had been in the Beatles, and that when it broke up, I then came to Canadian Brass. And I don't know if it's yeah. age, but you know, I just don't remember that. I've been trying to figure that. Was I in the Beatles? Was I, was well, I the drum? No, I wasn't the drummer. Well, they say if you don't remember the 60s or the 70s, then you weren't actually there. So there you go. So you were there. It makes sense. Yeah. And there is something strange about how the Beatles broke up in 1970 and Canadian Brass and started in 1970. There and there's a striking resemblance to Paul McCartney, obviously. Well, wasn't he standing backwards in the, uh, on right. the album cover? And standing backwards and apparently is dead. Uh, he's just a two of Could now. be. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that memory just comes back. This is very exciting. very exciting. So do you feel like there, do you have to pull your audience into your repertoire since there are those gaps and you may have just even age gaps in your audience or, mm -hmm. you know, different listeners, no, they have different they, aesthetics? They pull us. I mean, we can hardly stay on stage, and especially now we're told we cannot go off stage. Oh. And the audience, that pull is so strong. Uh, one of us might succumb and just, or maybe an instrument would go up there. Oh, that's actually it, possible. I know. would be careful in the concert if you're listening to this now. Get if, a little punk rock. If you're rock. in the front row, first 10 rows or so, the Chuck might gets a little nervous and it might slip out yeah. of his hands. If nothing else, watch out for spittle. 
Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the way, I mean, the way we go through our programs, it's been 50 years worth of, you know, 100 shows a year to experiment and use stage and performance with live audiences as a nice laboratory to try our, our new music and the standards. And then we really think a lot and talk a lot about musical momentum in our program and how we take our, our audience of all ages through, through the years or through the genres of music. Mm -hmm. And then having Caleb and Brandon in the group arranging things, especially for us, it's awesome. That's definitely something I wanted to ask you about, given that Caleb and Brandon have such a hand in arranging many of your pieces, and specifically for the two of you, do you feel like beyond taking ownership of that arrangement, do you feel like there's a, more of a connection, a deeper connection as you're working to um, refine the piece and then even as you're performing? Well, as an arranger, we're already listening to this piece over and over and over. And for me personally, usually the only way I can like kind of get rid of this earworm is if I arrange it. Uh, so uh, the arrangers do get to know the piece ahead of time even very well and and perhaps have the, the best grasp going into it, going into the uh, rehearsal of, of the piece. So we're both trying to do the original justice, but also sort of make it into its own brass piece. Mm -hmm. And for many listeners, uh, sometimes when we do a, a new or contemporary uh, song, a new arrangement of it, um, it's maybe the first time they've ever heard that song. So to them, it's an original brass piece. Yeah. It was actually for brass. So we're trying to figure out how we can actually make it sound like that, like it was meant for brass, mm. no matter the style of, of the piece being arranged. And it really comes to life when we bring it to our colleagues, because oftentimes we hear this piece and then we like imagine it for our for specific players. Like I start hearing a cello line, I'm like, oh, Achilles would do way better with that line. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you ever and then want it to comes to life. Out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Got to give it to Achilles. That's right. <laughs> Uh, and we bring it to rehearsal and then we start to hear it come to life. That's the coolest part. Or it falls flat on its face and dies. <laughs> That's right. And then we never do it in rehearsal. That's why we <laughs> leave new pieces another. off the program. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but I do think there is, um, there's something about like bringing a piece that we've kind of shaped ourselves, both as an arranger and as an ensemble, mm -hmm. and presenting it to an audience um, that I guess maybe it leaves the audience a little more willing to buy into it because yeah. it's like we we've put our heart and soul into this mm -hmm. um, and it helps that we don't have <laughs> the, the like the string quartet canon the haydn mozart beethoven and shostakovich string quartets so we have to uh find that connection with the audience in some other way and i think this is one of the ways we do it so obviously that immediate feedback from your colleagues i'm sure in the editing process is very invaluable so for Jeff, Achilles, and Chuck, when you're working on pieces that Brandon and Caleb have arranged, do you feel, what, is, what does it feel differently compared well, we to? We have our own meetings. The three of us then have Careful. to meet, and then we <laughs> complain, and we Got talk, it. and yep. parts. Yeah. Yeah. we come back into the group, They've and then we say, noticed. oh, that's very, very nice. It's really lovely. <laughs> and then we go back to three of us and say, how could they do that? Not, oh, very, not very nice, melody. guys. Not really one beautiful. melody. Yeah. <laughs> Can you yeah. famously think of a piece that you know, unfortunately, in the artistic process, you, we fail, and we have to get back up and try it again. Can you think of a specific piece that you were really excited about, and you performed it, and maybe the feedback wasn't what you anticipated? You know, I've never seen that, and I've been around a long time. But by the time we present a piece of music, first of all, we all have to love the piece we're going to present. Mm -hmm. If there's one person in the group that is really against playing a piece of music, you really can't go beyond that. You have to bring it to the group and the group buys in and really becomes part of that. Yeah. And then you're presenting something that you're already really familiar with and now it's just a matter of making that connection. So we would never, we would know well before taking it in front of an audience if a piece is, yeah. is working. And the nice thing about having two guys that are writing the music right here, they can listen to it and say, you know, I think I might want to change a little something. Come back to the next rehearsal, we've got a new piece of paper on the stand and it's, been revised so that's that's a nice process it's also a negative sometimes if you try and secretly leave a note out and they know you've left a note out <laughs> <laughs> maybe walking on eggshells there's some part you don't really like so <laughs> we're gonna erase that uh achilles uh, i think caleb mentioned earlier that you have a fondness for latin music so is there anything on the program that really connects to that latin flair that we could listen for yes we're gonna play some music of the great astor piazzolla 
And by the way, it's 100 years since he was born. Uh, so we're very excited. We're going to play uh, Libertango, one of the most uh, famous compositions by him. And yes, and if we had more time, we'll play more. But <laughs> <laughs> What's something about um, Libertango, if I said that correctly, yeah. that stands out to you? What makes you so connected to it? Well, Libertango is one of the signature pieces of Astor Piazzolla, who changed the tango music by adding elements of Western music and jazz and classical music into the tango, creating a brand new style of music that he named Nuevo Tango, New Tango. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the reasons also why this composition has been very successful and performed by many, many uh, artists all over the world. So uh, I think that this brass version is very unique. <laughs> Exciting. I'm excited to hear that. So given that maybe he has a strong connection to Libertango, for the rest of you, what's something from tomorrow or today's repertoire <laughs> that you would encourage your, our audience to maybe listen to a little bit differently as they approach it? I think something I find interesting, with, especially with Brandon and Caleb's arrangements, is that they're composer arrangers. So they, do, they don't just do what we call a transcription, which is make a copy of it for, mm -hmm. for us. So they add really interesting things. And one of my favorites, I think I drive the band crazy to keep asking to play this Danny Boy arrangement by Caleb. And we're doing that today. Uh, and it has a lot of rich, really interesting chords and some nice surprises and some, <clears throat> some nice horn lines. And, uh, but That's a Canadian piece, right? It is, Danny Canada Boy. claims it. I think yeah. it's Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> is there any vocal surprises in Danny Boy that we should be listening for? If there was, we wouldn't tell you. Cause then, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can tell me later. <laughs> okay. I'd like to know. <laughs> there are some vocal surprises in some other pieces, though. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. It shouldn't be a surprise for us, but we'll, we'll yeah. see. Any other pieces <laughs> or just maybe tips for our audience members of how to embrace some of the arrangements for today? Actually, in, in that piece with the surprise, there's another unusual element to it um, in terms of how to listen to it. Uh, it might be unusual because it features an instrument that's uh, not typically uh, featured that's not you know known as a solo instrument perhaps as much um and uh well that instrument is one of the larger ones in the group it could be any one of these things. <laughs> yeah. Definitely not this one. yeah anyway uh, uh yes uh we encourage you to listen down um the soloist really appreciates uh the listener listening down into the ensemble on this uh particular arrangement of uh tuba tiger rag oh, okay. um, otherwise known as Tiger Rag, but featuring the tuba. And uh, this one was arranged by one of our most beloved arrangers in the group uh, who used to work with Duke Ellington. His name is Luther Henderson. And he wrote hundreds of <clears throat> fantastic arrangements for the group, and uh, most of which were in jazz and Dixieland style. And Luther, as an arranger, was you know such an integral part of Canadian brass and uh, really, really helped the group achieved that known Canadian brass sound. Well, good. I'm, I'm excited to hear some of those pieces and <laughs> definitely gives me some pointers of what to listen for, especially listening for Chuck's hard work on, you said, tuba. Tuba, tiger rag, not tiger just tiger rag. rag. Yeah, <laughs> tuba, tiger, tuba rag. tiger rag. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for taking time to chat with me and helping our audience know a little bit more about what Great. to expect for today. We'll see you all very soon, I think. Thank you. Yeah.